anyone listening to me television, newspaper, or other account of the file case, or conducted any internet research or investigation during one week. I have all negative responses. If you recall, when we, uh, our last file day, the state did uh, rest its case. We are ready to proceed uh, with the defense's uh, case. Ms. Lord, you can call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Lord. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the evidentiary portion of the trial is now concluded. We are ready for closing arguments or summations. They go in reverse order of the openings. So, we're going to hear first from Ms. Lord, followed by the state. Ms. Lord? Thank you. Good morning. As you all know by now, beyond a reasonable doubt, that's the burden, that's the scheme. That's what the state has to convince each and every one of you beyond a reasonable doubt. And they have to do that with respect to each and every element of each offense and each offense before you can return a verdict. Of anything other than that. His Honor will give you the instructions for law that your sworn of his jurors indicated to follow. And he will give you the definition of reasonable doubt. And he will tell you that it's an honest and reasonable uncertainty existing in your minds as to the guilt of the person. I'd like to tell you what it's not. I think I touched on this a little bit while opening. If you go back in that jury room and you think that it's possible that Laura Houston committed these offenses, the law requires you to find her not guilty. If you think that maybe, not guilty. If you think that probably she committed any of these offenses, the law requires you to find her not guilty. Likely. Highly likely, not guilty. You see, you have to find in this fine country that the state has met its proof by the highest standard, the highest burden of proof we have in our legal jurisprudence. And with your permission, what I'd like to do is to discuss with you what I believe to be the doubt, the reasonable doubt that exists in this case. Aggravated manslaughter, and that here is 
reckless manslaughter. And when you see the word caused, that's causation. Okay. So that's how you apply that, and that's how you have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me talk to you for a second as to what causation is. You also have this. Okay. Causation has a special meaning under the law. To establish causation, the state must prove two elements, each beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that but for defendant's conduct, Felicia Dormans would not have died. And second, and this is where, obviously, you're aware of our position throughout the course of this trial, and that is the pretty tragic death of Felicia. It was an accident. And this is where you can consider our defense. And that is, the death must have been within the design or contemplation of the defendant. If not, it must involve the city. <clears throat> excuse me, the same kind of injury or harm as that designed or contemplated, it must also not be too remote or too accidental in its occurrence. Too accidental in its occurrence. So that's where you can pigeonhole our arguments and see whether or not the state has convinced you beyond a reasonable doubt. Now remember, that's causation. We don't have a burden. We only have to prove that this was an accident. They have to prove to you that it wasn't. And they have to prove to you that it wasn't, not just by a little bit, not just by a possibly, not just by a probably, likely or highly likely, but beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's the burden. So that's with respect to causation. And you have all of this, as I said, he's on the usual law. The second aspect of the law, which is talking about is is the second point, that is the <clears throat> state of mind. Now, <clears throat> so I'm fine when I wake up, as soon as I walk in this court, I'll keep <clears throat> it is. So, doubt number two. Recklessly. Now, with the exception of murder, which the state of mind is purposely or knowingly, which there, purposely in the moment, which in my position is kind of remotely close to proving that. I suspect an argument by the state with respect to about this. Now, mind you, they've got to prove causation beyond reason without and this state of mind. So then you're going to get the charge, and you're going to see the aggravated manslaughter. So now this is the second part, that the defendant did so recklessly. Okay. And you're also going to get the reckless manslaughter charge. And you see the second element here is that the defendant did so recklessly. Okay. And that's what they have to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt before you can find your way to your ad or recklessness. Let's talk about what that means. Okay. Person who causes another's death does so recklessly when he when she is aware of and consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that death will result from her coming. So, it must be a conscious disregard, a conscious disregard. Be aware of it, and you disregard it. Okay. Should have been aware, if you think maybe she should have been aware that her conduct might have posed a risk, that someone might get hurt, that's not criminal. That is not a crime. That's a different courthouse. That's a civil suit must be a conscious disregard. You believe that she should have known better. That's enough. The state has not met its proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now let's talk about the facts. Okay. I'm give you a little bit of guidance with respect to where you pigeonhole the facts. The Elements of conscious disregarding. You learn through the course of the trial that a few things exist. The judge and I suggest she wasn't here. She was prescribed not one, not two, not three, but four, I believe, separate and distinct medications from a doctor. And the prescription group in that week. She was on muscle relaxers. She was on Xanax. All prescribed that week. Medical marijuana. 
Lexapro all that week. And Methadone all that week. And she tells you in her statement that she did not intend for the firearm to harm. And if you take all those factors into consideration, it's my suggestion to you that that materially affects whether or not anyone under those circumstances could have a conscious disregard for anything. And as I indicated to you, should have been aware is not a criminal, it's not heartless. And what's also important to keep in mind is that I, I suspect the state is closing arguments. Now again, they go last because they have the burden of proof. I don't get to go again. So throughout the course of my comments, what I would like to do is maybe anticipate what they would say because I can't hear them say, oh, by the way, but you know, we heard that, but what about this? If they even remotely suggest to you that loading a gun in the same room with someone is, is reckless. It's just not true. It needs to be a conscious, conscious disregard. traumatic circumstances is not guilt. It's just panic. The forensic textbooks, the forensic textbooks teach to ignore panic. Do you remember the testimony of Dr. Hood when I cross-examined him with the forensic textbooks in the field? They teach a scenario where a boyfriend watches a girlfriend use his gun to kill herself and he panics and starts cleaning up the crime scene and takes the gun and takes off. And they teach that to objective forensic experts for a reason. Because you're not supposed to look at the subjective facts because anyone can freak out and do irrational things. No one, no one, no one. When you want to rip, you find yourself in this identical set of facts and you can imagine It's startling when you were expecting it to happen. And the next thing you know, you look over at your wife, and she slumped over. Everybody can agree with that. Detective LaRosa, even in the statement with Laura, said people do things out of sheer panic. We do not punish for rational behavior. And stress and trauma are breeding grounds for irrational behavior. Somebody once explained stress and panic to me like this. Picture a plant. Long enough for you to walk. You do this wide. You lay it on the floor. You can walk over the plank from one side of the plank to the other. No problem. Probably do it a million times. Without being nervous, without falling off, without losing your balance. But you take that very same plank and you put a hundred feet in the air between two buildings and then try to walk it. The stress feet are falling on that very same plank it's easy to do down there. That is not the same walk. That's how stress and trauma and being frightened affect you. And here she went to Lowe's. She got shovels. One thing if she got the shovels in advance. 
She went to Lowe's and she got the shovels in advance and she dug a hole in advance. Yeah, you'd think maybe that had something to do with what her intentions were. But afterwards, in a panic, not knowing what to do, a failed attempt to, to do what? She freaked out. She didn't even do it. And she didn't go anywhere. She stayed in that house for hours. So, as I said, she was shocked and scared. And it told me the experience ourselves. We can't judge how we would react if someone else believed we were that rational. But you never know. Let's look at the objective facts if we can. So, doubt number four. that Felicia, I'm sorry, Laura, had to kill Felicia. Did any witness get on that witness stand and tell you they weren't getting along? Did any witness tell you that they were fighting? Did any witness tell you there was any turmoil in that relationship? No, not a one. Where's the motive? You know, the instructions will tell you, the jury trial will tell you, the state doesn't have to prove motive for murder. What you can take into consideration, the absence of motive with respect to whether or not they met their burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecutor stood up here in his opening statement several weeks ago, and he said to you, these are his words, there was no argument that day. So Laura Lucy just decides to get up one day, take a gun, and shoot her wife? Just out of the blue? With no prior history before you in this in, in, uh, in the record at all? Come on. Does that make any sense at all? Figuring? So the cop, LaRosa, he's got a woman in front of him, and he's got her dead wife. And so he asks questions. Oh, come on. Were you fighting? Uh, were you bickering? Were you doing this? So she's as honest as the day is long. Yeah, well, like any other marriage folk, we bicker. We bickered about the dishes at 7 o'clock in the morning. Well, she didn't get up till 9 o'clock because she saw the text messages, and then later she said she didn't get up till 9. She was telling yeah, we bicker. We bicker back and forth like any, any, ma any normal married person. Maybe about the dishes. She didn't tell them that they bicker. She didn't have to tell them they bicker about the dishes. You would never know whether or not they've ever bickered about the dishes. And she's like, yeah, but I didn't kill her. I didn't intend this to happen. I loved her. She was the love of my life. She was my soulmate. That's what she's telling him. Frantically. I mean, you saw her in that statement. You saw the emotion. You saw the tears. That was raw. And that was real. That's what you saw. The text message. Last minute, at the end of the case, they introduced this text message. One forty nine PM. Hey Tina, we're working things out. Sorry about earlier. Is this now a oops, I better put some evidence of motive in the case and take the text message out of context and put it before the jury so they can speculate what's even meant by that? Even if this is even Laura texting. I mean you saw examples of Felicia using the phone. And what's interesting? What is interesting? What is Tina Mom? That's how it's saved. What is her response? Her response is, okay, is she talking to me again? Her response is, is she talking to me again? Now, I went through the rest of the text messages. Apparently, they didn't. July 23rd, just the week before, week and a half before, through July 27th, I believe. And it was a heated argument. Nasty and heated art text argument exchange between Felicia and her mother. Nasty, heated text argument between the two of them. And then what is the response? Is she talking to me again? The response is, okay, I'm glad you guys are getting along now. Okay, I'm glad, you know, whatever you're about, you're no longer fighting about. 
It's, is she talking to me again? That's what happens when you take a text message, one text message, out of context, like they've been doing throughout the course of this trial, the entire course of this trial, and you just throw it there and throw it to the wall and see what sticks. What's the next response? I don't think so, because then she was bitching about the stuff about her dad. You heard about that in her statement, how angry she was, how she's not talking to her parents, Felicia, because her, her dad raped her. That's in the statement. I don't think so, because then she was bitching about the stuff about her dad. So, was that like a last minute, I don't know, we got to give some motive there? changing their theory, the prosecutor's argument that there was no argument that day after the course of the trial, he's got to change gears all of a sudden. That's what he told you in opening. He also told you in opening, and you will hear that Laura says she loves her life, but at the same time talks about credit cards. I hung on his every word in the book down. You may or may not remember, but that's what he said. And talk about, when I stood up here and I told him about him taking big things out of context, what did you hear on that statement? You hear the detective say to Laura, Laura, what is the worst thing you guys have ever thought about? This is his question. This isn't her volunteering anything. Laura, what is the worst thing you ever thought about? Oh, we thought about credit card bills. When was that? Two years ago, the detective asks, she answers, and she puts it in context. But somehow they want to make you believe that, this, that they have some kind of financial problems going on that would cause Laura to kill her out of the blue? That's insulting. That's insulting. Take these lines out of context and say, oh, yeah, here's a motive. How about going to the bank and producing some physical evidence? Oh, look, they're in financial debt. They owe money here, they owe money. How about bringing in forensic physical evidence? Or maybe they try, but just nothing is there. There's nothing there. This is their best effort to try to say, oh, you know, what she really wanted, wanted to kill her, wanted to wake up one day and say, oh, I want to kill her, I want to, I want to shoot her right in the face. Come on.
in the manual that they give for the gun, it doesn't tell you that you have to hold the grip safety in to charge it and load it. It doesn't tell you that. But Laura told you that. And Laura told the detective that Felicia had trouble loading the gun. She said she was loading the gun while on the bed. Well, what you saw <clears throat> is that in the foot of the bed, there's a safe. It's right here. See, one, have it circled. And in the safe is the ammunition. Right there. Consistent with sitting on the bed, reaching for the ammunition, and loading the firearm. She's asked, where is the gun? I left it on the bed. After this horrible thing happened, she flung the gun, didn't want anything to do with it, and it just landed on the bed. Well, where did you see the gun? They found it, right there on the bed. She didn't take that gun. That wasn't any backpack. She didn't touch that gun. She didn't hide it. She didn't throw it away. She didn't take it. She didn't dispose of it. She didn't bury it. Nothing. Nothing. Things you might have expect if somebody intentionally did something wrong. She threw it on the bed. Felicia was sitting on the floor. She said, so Felicia was sitting on the floor when she got top. Well, we learned a few things. You found that there's blood spatter on the lower portion of the sliding glass uh, closet, by the way. No blood spatter expert at all come in to say what that means, but it's in the general area where she would be seated. Um, blood in the place else, no blood on the dresser, no blood on the walls, no blood any place else, except exactly lower to the ground, where you expect it if somebody's sitting on the ground. You also burned through a photograph um, that I had, that actually the state stipulated was in fact photograph of Felicia in a bedroom, seated on the floor. Laura said she liked to, to sit on the floor, extend her legs because she had problems with her knees. Bones to run or something like that. And lo and behold, I didn't have to go far. You aren't found that picture? In their cell phone extractions that they had, that they never looked at. Imagine all they do is show you August 6, 2017. Don't even tell you. Don't even tell you that they have fallacious cell phone. Want to make you think that, oh, it's missing. Oh, you know, Laura's lying about that. We'll talk about that. <laughs> but it's right there on the cell phone extraction. Shows the habit pattern and custom to sit on the floor exactly where Laura said she was seated. She said she felt her pulse and she was dead. She ran over to her, felt her pulse, and she was dead. She didn't know what to do. What did Dr. Who tell us? Death was instantaneous. Independent corroboration, she was telling the truth. That's number eight. She told the detective she thought of running. To be honest with you, she says, I thought of running. She's telling him. He, he had no idea. They're not in the back, uh, they're not in a car. And by the way, it wasn't like it was a suitcase pack that they would know that somebody's like really packing to leave. It was a backpack with some weed, pills, and a, and a rumor. But she said, to be honest with you, I was thinking of money. But she didn't. And what did I think? A backpack in the car. She told him that. The guns, she, he asked, well, when did you last touch the gun? And she says, well, the guns are moved almost every day. They move from the table to the floor, all over. Well, I will concede the first time that I read that, I was like, what's the next talk about that? She moved the gun to wherever she goes. I go to the floor of the table. So what do I do? I look at the evidence that they gave me. The cell phone extraction from Laura's phones. The cell phone extraction from Felicia's phones. And what do you see? You see pictures inside the home of the gun on the table, of the gun on the bed, of the gun in the dresser. Exactly where she said, what she said happens, happens. There's even a dog video I played for you yesterday. She cute little dog barking at the TV or, or the fireplace. There's a round glass table and there's the gun just sitting there because they're there. She told
told them that. And it's backed up by the evidence. Now, that's their normal. That might not be your normal. That might not be my normal. But that's their normal. And she told them about it. And there's proof of it. And unfortunately, the more a gun is handled, taking it from the room to the bedroom to the floor, the more likely you could have an accidental discharge. By two silly girls who have issues with respect to prescription medication, apparently. She told the cop that she ran over to her and she had blood on her face and she had the baby wipes and wiped her face and kissed her and hugged her and held her. And what do we see? On the dresser, the baby wipes. And she, they said, well, what'd you do with the baby wipes? I put it in the trash. And what do you see? Baby wipes in the trash. Everything she told them is corroborated by the facts, the objective facts. And Mr. Zane, the forensic medical examiner's investigator who goes to the scene, writes in his report, it appears as if the face was right. Felicia broke her phone. She tells the cop in the statement that Felicia broke her phone. Okay. There's a photograph of the galaxy note. Let's see if I can move this one. You can see here and here. Appears to be cracked. And you have to ask yourselves, why did the prosecution, why did they not tell you that they had a cell phone extraction of this phone? Why did they not want you to know that the last communication on that phone was July 29th of before? Maybe they knew that it would give her story credibility that she told the police. Felicia broke her phone about a week ago. So what she said, it's what's in the evidence, it's what they didn't tell you. You learn that from us. It's a lot of stuff you learn from us. But you have to ask yourself this. She said, Felicia was fighting with her parents. You'll learn that through the text messages I wrote out from July 23rd and August 6th. How about this? She tells them, she's asked about the bullet. She's loading the firearm. And she says, there was one or two in it already. And then she says she's putting about maybe seven to nine. She wasn't sure the number, maybe eight. One or two in it already. Seven to nine, she loaded in. Well, when they found the firearm, there were nine. One was extended, one was defected. There's the seven, total nine. Lo and behold, one or two, exactly what she said. Exactly what she said. She knew because she was loading the gun. She was loading the gun on the bed, got the ammunition from the safe at the foot of the bed. And she told them, even a bullet's match, even the amount, how would she know that if she wasn't loading the gun? She told them that she went to Lowe's. She told them, yeah, I went to Lowe's. They don't say, hey, did you go to Lowe's? She says, I went to Lowe's. She even tells them that she went in the garden center 
and you see a video from the garden center on Mars. What does that prove? Show us real evidence. Don't show us in Lowe's buying a shovel that means nothing. And did you see her at the cash register? She was pacing back and forth and laughing. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Formative evidence it says that the angle is a little down. That's what Dr. Hood tells us. Falls to her right. On the, uh, on the A little downward. Everything, everything that she told the police that had meaning, that had significance, that put everything in context, is independently corroborated 